Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Reelabilities Film Festival. I'm Isaac Zablocki. I am the director and co-founder of Reelabilities. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for being a part of this amazing event we kicked off last night um, with our drive-in event, which was a lot of fun. Um, hope for those of you who couldn't be there, hope you uh, have checked the film out virtually. It's a New York Times uh, critics pick for this week, best summer ever. So, um, really check that out and get into the spirit in a fun way of, of this whole festival. We have a week of amazing films um, of all different kinds. So please join us for as many programs as possible. Every, the, week, the films are available all week long. Um, but of course, um, the conversations, which are the real important part in some ways, is what anchors this program and um, gives us a real schedule. So please join us for as many of these as possible. Um, I should, of course, first note um, that uh, these events will all have live transcription. You could just click on the live transcript um, um, button that we have here and our wonderful captioner, Lauren Schechner, who we're very grateful to, has been a member of the Real Abilities family for many, many years now, um, will be captioning um, all of our events. Um, thank you, Lauren. I wanna give a huge thank you to all of our sponsors and all of our supporters. Check them out at our um, partners page. Of course, all of our partners who really do a lot of the work um, that these films um, inspire you to engage with. Um, they do the work on the ground. So um, check out our different partners. I want to highlight for um, this program specifically, um, CBST, CBST, Congregation Beit Simchas Torah, which is uh, a, uh, the leading gay and lesbian synagogue here um, in New York. Um, DTCC, which has been a sponsor of uh, the festival for a few years now, and we're excited um, to make them a part of the festival again, and specifically um, take part in this film and this conversation. And all of our conversations are um, supported by Vimeo, and we are extremely grateful and love the relationship um, with Vimeo. Um, we also usually have, when we're in person, we have our, um, our films in different locations throughout the city. And the Maisel's Documentary Center have been amazing partners um, throughout the years. And um, we're, we're really excited to um, have them as uh, partners for um, this screening um, today. So um, to move things forward towards the conversation, um, please, um, I'll hand things over to Alison Leitz from the Maisel Documentary Film Center. Hi everybody, my name is Alison Leitz. I am a programmer and a cin the cinema manager at Maisel's Documentary Center. Um, for those of you who haven't visited us in person, uh, we're located in Harlem at 127th and Lenox. Um, we're doing all sorts of different programming, a lot of which will be outdoors this year. So we hope that for those of you who can join us, you will. Um, all of that's on our website at mazels.org. Thank you, Morgan, <laughs> it's in the chat. Um, quick word about this film. I uh, am so ex extremely excited to be co-presenting this film. I think this is such an important story and um, one that has brought, um, I think in a, in, a, in a world where representation is such an important part of how we see ourselves and how we've been taught to see ourselves in those who we are told to look up to, this is certainly an important and um, yeah, crucial story that is being told currently. So I'm super grateful that Franco and Jen are able to join us. And without further ado, um, Judith will be, Judith Raiskin will be our moderator today. She's a professor at the University of Oregon um, in the Queer and Disability Studies Department. Um, and she's also working right now on a project with the Eugene Lesbian Oral History Project, which where she's working with filmmakers as well as documenting the oral histories of the lesbian, lesbian community in Eugene between 1965 and 1995. So I'll let Judith take it from here. We're thrilled to have you all with us today. Thank you so much. Judith, you're on mute. I was gonna say, I, I wish there was a queer and disability studies uh, department, but we do have minors. I'm in the women's and gender sexuality studies department here. Um, I, I love this film and I'm so happy that, um, I have to get rid of this here, what's it got? Uh, here. 
I'm, I'm so happy to be able to moderate um, this conversation with the directors, Rivka Beth Meadow and, and Jen Rainan, and then the subject of the movie, Franco Stevens. And um, I just, uh, you know, I, I think of like so many students of, in all my areas who would love to see this film and will see this film. And so I'm, I'm really happy to have this opportunity. So let me just put the first question to Rivka and Jen um, as directors. Uh, what, what were your goals when you started to make this film? Um, like what were your intentions? And then did those goals change over time? Yeah, <laughs> it changed a lot over time. <laughs> Um, wow. So this film actually had a, fun, a kind of a cool, fun evolution. It started, um, well, <laughs> it started as a, a narrative film. I thought as uh, I got to know Franco and her story in the early years of our marriage, um, wow, this, is, this would make such a great fiction film. I should absolutely write a screenplay and make this into a film. And so I started uh, doing my research and talking with a lot of the women who were around in Franco's world in the early days of the magazine. And, and I started realizing how uh, poorly their stories and our stories as queer women have been told over the years. And, and that, that prompted the very first shift uh, to make this a documentary rather than um, a narrative film. So that was the beginning. <laughs> and then we just sought to, to create a, a historical piece. The, the, a time bound piece really from about the time that um, Franco was outed, um, which you'll see in the film if you haven't already seen, and, um, and the time uh, where, you know, to, through starting the magazine, Deneuve magazine, um, to where uh, Catherine Deneuve sued her for using a similar name, um, and then the shift of the magazine to be Curve. Um, and that was going along swimmingly. And then in the middle of filming, we got a call from the woman who Franco had sold the magazine to saying, gee, um, this is such awful news, but I don't think I can keep the magazine afloat um, much longer. But I think that the, the mission of Curve is still really important. I think that there's still a need um, for, for, for queer women's stories to be told for our uh, for, for us to um, focus on our visibility and our, our culture, um, will you help me figure out what that could look like? And that's where the movie shifted again <laughs> and opened up. Do you wanna Rivka, talk a little bit about what happened then? <laughs> um, sure, I, I think that, um, you know, whenever you're making a film, there are so many decision points along the way. And this was a really big one. We decided that there were so many conversations that Franco and her crew had started in the 90s that had, you know, the seeds of which we have, we see come to fruition today, right? There's still conversations that we're having in community and, you know, that have gotten a lot more sophisticated, but that are really um, evolving. And so Franco was game to reach out and go on this journey and let us, you know, really graciously let us follow her as she reached out to some incredible queer leaders today, we followed uh, Kim Catron, conversations between Franco and Kim Catron, who's based up in Toronto, who does incredible educator work uh, with queer community and conversation with corporations. We also were able to connect with Denise Froman, who's a poet and uh, yeah, it was, it, um, all right, Jen, I'm going to hand it back to you. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Anyway, yes. <laughs> so we, we definitely shifted a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the, one of the incredible values of this film, I think, is this intergenerational conversation that's, that's happening. Um, and it's, you know, this film is a history lesson, but it's also a cultural exchange. And I'm wondering how you see this film as informing a conversation between older and younger queer identified people. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because well, the, the, in, the, in the journey of the film, uh, in my journey, we go on a quest to find out the relevance of the magazine today and what the queer women's community to, of today needs and wants. I mean, do they want a magazine? Do they even consider themselves lesbian? So it really takes us on this cross-generational journey. Um, and I learned so much uh, during the course of that. And um, 
you know, it was really enlightening. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have a question, I have a question yeah. for you, Franco. Um, uh, Deneuve and Curve magazine helped make lesbians visible. And those issues of representation are really important. And um, the magazine helped make lesbians visible to themselves and to others. And I'm wondering um, if you see your work with this film, with this particular film doing something similar for people with disabilities, making- Oh, wow. Interesting. You know, um, that, making lesbians visible to ourselves within our community and externally was, act, was the mission of the magazine, uh, the number one mission. And um, I think the way that I, uh, approach my disability is it's, it is part of me. Um, just like being queer is a part of me. I come as a whole package. Um, and if it can help even one person, well then that's great. Yeah, I see such interesting parallels between the LGBTQ pride movement and the disability or crypt pride movement. And, um, and your movie kind of brings those together. And I'm, uh, do you have any thoughts about that? You know, about sort of how the different movements might inform each other? Well, you know, well, there is, there is a parallel, but, you know, I was saying that, you know, those are, those are part of my whole, just like being Jewish is part of my whole, um, whole person, my whole being. And, you know, uh, you can choose to hide to be gay for the most part. Um, you know, me as a disabled person with a visible disability, um, you know, I kind of wear it on my sleeve. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I need to figure out how one community um, influences the other if there is such a thing. Yeah, I was. I don't know. I was just kind of. I was kind of taken back by that question because I need to give it more thought. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. That beautiful student um, at UC Merced that you film, uh, mm -hmm. who, who's who's struggling with the fact that her mother says, "You know, I would have aborted you had I known you were gay." And this is such oh. an existential question for many people with disabilities, and you know that the right to be here and and the value of a of a of a group of people who's, who's not valued, you know, to say like, this is what we bring to the community. This is what we bring to society um, that, you know, we, we, we're of value and, have, and having to sort of explore that and make that visible. I, you know, when, when that student said that, I thought, oh, you know, there's a lot of people in this film festival who are gonna relate to that, um, although it's a different issue. A different right. Issue. Yeah, I mean, there is a definite parallel there. Yeah. You know, and I think it's less of us having the issue with it than, you know, the people that love us that in their, you know, in their brain had a different expectation of what our lives would be before we were born. Um, you know, and that's their journey to go on, you know. Well, that journey motif is really strong, too, because, you know, when you're, um, I mean, I don't want to spoil that for anyone who hasn't seen the film yet, but, you know, you start off at the Seder Passover dinner. You know, and then and then are sent sent packing with nothing on your back, not even unleavened bread. You know, and yeah. um, then you go on this thirty-year, forty-year journey, and yeah. you know, so there's the sort of the the metaphor of being cast out, and then you know being that you know um, being the stone that was cast out, and then becoming the cornerstone. I mean, you've done exactly that. You know, become the cornerstone for exploring lesbian identity, and in, in all its changing iterations. And um, so I think you have some beautiful metaphors. I think Jen and Rivka, you made some beautiful metaphors in this in this film, um, and I, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I was how you navigated your relationship in this movie? Of, <laughs> uh, you know, you've got directors married to the subject, and sort of what kind of boundaries you had to set, or what kind of editorial um, options maybe you had, Franco? Uh, what, what happened in that? Well, I think if the movie was in the hands of people other than Jen and Rivka, who I both adore, um, I wouldn't have been as open and forthright. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, there were certain things that I thought were absolutely off the table when we first started filming that I slowly, um, you know, slowly went, you know what, if you want to ask me, I'm okay with that. 
And it's really put me in a different place to be a more open person. So, you know, it was scary. And uh, we actually, it it brought our relationship closer together. Um, I married the perfect person for me. So I don't know how it could have gotten any better, but (laughs) it did, you know, we, we didn't kill each other during the filming of the movie or the release of the movie. So not even once. No. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, for me, I don't know. I think about it a little bit like, I mean, clearly there was an enormous amount of trust that was placed in my hands and and Rivka's hands. um, And we're, I was, very careful. I've been very careful to make sure that your story was told accurately, fully. I, you know, you said early on, like, I'll tell you whatever you want to know, but um, just don't paint me to be like a superhero. Like, I mean, yeah, I did. I did this thing, but I also didn't do it by myself and I made mistakes and I, I don't want to, I don't want people to think that I'm, you know, I don't know, like some kind of superhero. Um, so I think we were really, really careful to try to represent Frank Ovas as a complete and full person. And I think about, I mean, what it did for our marriage, actually, uh, I can see how it might have gone the other way. But uh, when my, this is a little bit of a weird flyer here, but when my father passed away, um, I, people came out of the woodwork p- from all corners of his life to tell me these amazing stories about him that I'd never heard before. I got to know my dad in a way better after he passed than I did when he was alive. And I know that that's a fairly common experience. I got to have that experience with this extraordinary, very alive, fabulous woman that I get to continue to live with um, as a result of making this film. I got to really dig into, you know, talking to the ex-girlfriends and the- (laughs) When I said nothing (laughs) was off limits, it really wasn't. (laughs) And the family members and the, you know, people she used to work with and people who she didn't even really know, but were in the community who she, affected and impacted. I think you learned some things too, yeah? From of, about how the impact that you had in the world just from making this film. Yeah, I mean, I thought after I, um, you know, handed the reins over to the magazine, I just kind of thought, you know, yes, I did this cool thing and hopefully it will go on to, you know, have impact longer than, than I'm doing it. Um, but I guess I didn't realize just how much I, um, you know, I help people in their own lives. Yeah, what a wonderful thing to to find out and to learn about. Have you had any uh, reactions to the film that have surprised you or or been particularly gratifying? Ooh, well, I can say I'm really looking to the wide release uh, that's gonna happen in June because Mm -hmm. a lot of my friends and family haven't even yet seen it. So we've been very mean that way. I'm sorry, family and friends. (laughs) But it is releasing widely June first, so anywhere you can rent or buy. Uh, uh, and then I will just drop a little teaser out there. Somebody else has picked us up, so if you happen to subscribe to a certain service, maybe. But I can't tell you what it is yet. Killing me. Um, I want to yeah. also. Oh, can I no, just say yeah. one thing about? So this thing that you did with this magazine, and I, I hearing you talk about like realizing, wow, you know, I really did have this impact, and I, I, I just hoped that it would go on and, and continue to help the community. Um, I am going to do a little spoiler alert here, um, but for good reason. The process of making the film. Um, showed us that really there is still a deep need for us to tell our stories to and to um, share them um, you know with across generation and and widely with each other um, so we started the curve foundation so uh, to continue to to lift up queer women's voices and tell our stories so hopefully um, people will be inspired to go and check that out we're really really excited about our programming there yeah. and we have our first award um, oh yeah with the uh, yeah with nlgja the uh, association for um, lgbtq journalists uh, there's a curve award to help uh, emerging journalists who are focused on telling queer women's stories which is pretty neat i think so, it's time uh, to open up questions to others okay. um, uh, from the audience thank you um 
And I, I just wanted to start with uh, one question um, that I had. And, and of course, um, anybody who has questions from the audience, please paste them in the chat, place them in the chat, and we will call on you and open your mic so you can be a part of this conversation as well. Um, but um, I, the selection process with this film was really interesting, I have to say, mm -hmm. um, because um, it's, it's, and we love it, that it's not a disability film. This, is, this film, the drama is not the disability. The story is not the disability. It just happens to be a part of, of um, Franco's life and uh, the, the reality. And, um, and for some of our selection members, this was really a, it's something that they had to like really figure out if this is something that is right for the Real Abilities Film Festival, um, obviously, you, you know what answer we got to. Um, but my question is, is, is is really, and it connects to some of what you were discussing before, um, as far as this being the part that disability played in this film, um, was that um, something that you considered um, it, within kind of the storytelling of the film? Like what, what, what kind of part of, 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 the, of the film the disability element is going to play? You want to answer that? No, no, you want, okay. So in, in the first sort of iteration where it was meant to just be a historical story, uh, it was mostly a, a sit and lit kind of interview with archival footage kind of a, a movie. And at that point, um, I, so Franco was not disabled until uh, 1996, seven. Seven, 1997. So that was after the period of time in, this, in the film originally. So we didn't actually think through um, how to portray or talk about the disability or introduce it because it wasn't showing up in the story that we were telling until we got that call from the, the owner of Curve saying, ah, you know, this is happening. And it's, it spun us off into that, um, into shooting a lot of verite footage of Franco going out into the world. And when Franco goes out into the world now, she's in a wheelchair. And so we just included it because it's, it was just a part of the story. And, and then as we dug into that journey, there was, and you, you see it in the film, that moment where, you know, we had to talk about, well, you know, why did, can you explain, like, tell us why you sold the magazine? Why did that have to happen? What is it like for you to have this disability? I will tell you, for, for me, living with, um, with this incredible love of my life, who, and I'm very keenly aware of what her, her physical situation is and the, the pain that she struggles with on a daily basis, I had never heard her describe it so powerfully and clearly um, until the day that we filmed the one scene where she showed me. She, takes, she took the scissors and held them over my hand to show me what it was like for her all day, every day. The, the scissors may not drop all day, but they might, they might at any moment. And so she lives with that incredible tension and anxiety. It was the most visceral uh, thing I've ever seen. I, I've never seen uh, or heard um, a description like that that was so powerful and so it was, just, it was so helpful for me to understand your experience of the world. And in that moment, I thought, oh, oh this is gonna be really, I think this is gonna be helpful just to put out in the world, to see, to help build empathy, to help um, people understand. Because even today, I think you still get questions like, well, why, why did you, why, could, why couldn't you run the magazine as a disabled person? Why did you give it up? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little tiny bit? Sure. For, I mean, sure. Um, my disability is um, I have complex regional pain syndrome or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. It's called both things. Um, it was caused by an accident I had at work in 1997. And the more times they operated, the worse uh, the worse my pain my pain syndrome got um, to the point where I couldn't get out of bed. Um, you know, I would, uh, you know, be in bed for 24 hours a day for a long time. I didn't leave my house. Um, the pain continued to um, travel 
uh, up my legs, um, into my groin and sometimes into my hands. Um, I think like right now, maybe I have, um, kind of, I'm kind of in the best place, but I do have days like today. Um, you know, it was very possible that I couldn't even sit in on this interview because the pain is so debilitating. Um, you know, I have lost a lot of friends because I can't always show up. Um, you know, ironically, the isolation that a lot of people felt during COVID was something me as a disabled person was like, oh, well, this is kind of my realm of reality. Like I felt like I was more able to deal with the isolation of COVID because I've been dealing with it for so long. And some days I have good days and I have less pain, but I always have that anxiety um, that goes along with knowing this pain uh, is not going to end. Um, and it could happen, you know, at any point and does. I mean, there's, there's no controlling it. Um, yeah, so. I also think that all the medication I've taken over the years to, you know, or trials that I've done to, to try and mitigate the pain have taken a toll on my mental capacity. I don't think I've uh, mentioned that anywhere before. It's pretty brave. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, we have a question from Kathleen Ray. Kathleen, you're on the line. Hi, I just want to first say express a lot of appreciation to the filmmakers, especially to Franco for um, laying the foundation for a lot of queer youth today. And so my question is, I'm curious about um, the filmmakers and um, Franco's perspective on the impact of this film um, in light of the pandemic, where I think a lot of um, queer youth that might experience a lot of like liberation and connection with other people um, are kind of reduced to their houses, maybe in volatile home environments or maybe just in an isolating environment. So I'm curious about your sense of an impact that um, media like this can have on queer youth, especially in light of this pandemic. I think, I think anytime you see yourself reflected in film, you know, it, it feels so um, validating, especially when the story is you know, not one of, oh, you know, we kill, it. we, you know, we're lesbians are killers and queer people are right. bad. And or we just have to commit suicide because it's too horrible out there to be yeah. a lesbian. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Those are the stereotypes. Uh, the classic lesbian movie. You know, it's hard enough to be a, to be a part person who's married with a family living with COVID and to be a queer youth is so difficult in its own right. Um, to be a disabled youth is, I'm sure, is equally, you know, difficult in its own way. Um, you know, younger people, I mean, you know, it's like when you get old, you're like, oh, if I was only young again. And then you're like thinking, wait a second, that was so hard. So hard. I can't even imagine going through that during COVID. It's like, oh. You know, yeah. Judith asked earlier, um, uh, if we were surprised by any of the reactions of anyone to this film. And uh, what I meant to say is that when we took the film out for test screenings, um, we were expecting, fully expecting people our age and older would completely be like, oh yeah, that's our story, we know. And we didn't expect, we didn't know what to expect from a younger audience. Young queer people who see this film um, have overwhelmingly embraced it, have had, have, have found it, to really hit home, um, what I we're hearing is that uh, that, they're, that they're craving understanding of their legacy, their lineage. Where do they come from? Um, you know, what? Who are the who are the role models? What what was it like not very long ago? You know, their parents' generation. Um, it, it's it's so critically important that we that we tell positive stories of, uh, of, our, of the strong role models, the women who, you know, paved the way. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds and a little also, trite, but it's true. Yeah, well, and also the, um, the award we're doing with NJGLA is for emerging journalists. Yes. So to get our stories out there with journalists who haven't been supported uh, in a sense. Yeah, really important. Yeah. We gotta take care of our storytellers. I have to say that I have found that with my, my project too about the uh, Eugene Lesbian Oral History Project that 
the young people that I see every day, they are, they are loving it. I mean, they just want to know. They, don't, they didn't come from lesbian grandmothers, uh, but they have some in town. And so, you know, you can't really know your future unless you know your past and you can't know where you're going if you haven't seen where people have gone before you. So I, I think your film is right in there and I can really see why young um, people are gonna just love it and find it so important. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Lynn, Lynn Barton Rizal. You have to unmute. Work. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, Franco and Jen, I would love to know if you have any advice for parents whose kids, especially under the age of 13, um, are expressing uncertainty or certainty um, about their sexuality and how society, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> what do parents, what should, ideally, what would you have parents do for their children who are expressing curiosity or certainty of things that are not what we grew up with, like pansexuality and the broader terms? Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you're talking from experience that maybe you have a child who's questioning or knows their sexuality. Um, you know, what would have been really helpful for me uh, when I came out, my, you know, my mom was like, ah, well, I obviously did something wrong and now you're embarrassment to me and the family. Um, and what I really needed her to say was, you know, I love you and you're still the same person. These are some issues mm -hmm. that I need to get over. Um, if there are, if, right. If there are, <laughs> you know, and just take the, I would say, um, if my, if I had a child that was straight, uh, which I do, I would just treat them as I would an age appropriate child that is discovering their sexuality, um, or their gender identity. Uh, you know, if, if they have the freedom to choose, um, who they love, and with your support, they can choose somebody that really cares about them. Yeah. And if they choose to wear gender non-conforming, um, you know, clothes, you know, it's going to make them really love you if you support their decisions. You know. Yeah, I think just uh, you know, showing up with a lot of love and curiosity, because you know what, no matter what, <laughs> your kids, all of our kids, are going to have a different experience in the world than we did. They all will, whether they're queer or straight or whatever they are. I think <laughs> today are. it's more like, oh, I'm just fluid. I'm just- Or I'm fluid, yeah. I'm you not know. binary. I mean, just showing up with curiosity and staying open. I don't know. This is <laughs> turning into a different kind of a talk show here, but really, you know, we just love our kids. That's it, that's it. We just love them. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question from Natalie. Natalie, you're on the air. Okay. Hi, Natalie. Hi. Hi. Thank you for um, taking the time out to do this today. I just wanted to ask about um, speaking to the intergenerational themes that you just spoke to earlier. I was thinking about genes, um, digital genes, genes, and how they're run by a lot more, just like queer disabled youth. And um, I just I wanted to know what is your ideas about um, genes in comparison to the business of print magazines? Um, because Franco, you said obviously after your disability made it very difficult to run the magazine, but genes are a bit of a different landscape because they're non hierarchical feel and they're digital. So yeah, what are your general thoughts on genes? Um, wow, that is a good question. I mean, you talk a lot about just the importance of and the, and the fantastic ability that we now have in this digital age for everyone to tell their own story, to be the authors of their own experience and how, how freeing that is. I mean, wow, when you, you, you used to need to print a magazine, yeah. which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars for each issue just to like be able to put your message out there. 
And, and now, and now you can really get your story out there in so many different ways. I mean, yeah, it seems, it seems to me like, like it's a, a, maybe it feels overwhelming. There's so many there's, options. There's but, so many options. Um, but it's so it's uh, it, it's also really freeing and exciting. Um, I mean, it's one of my favorite things to do is to just sort of pop in. We have a uh, a friend, um, Angie Williams, who runs something called My Umbrella. Are you familiar with My Umbrella? Ah, uh, take a look. Um, she's putting out. It's basically her own publication and. Um, it's online. It's online. And it's, you know, it's a way for her to put her voice out there to tell the stories of her own uh, experience in the world. Um, and it's really powerful. And I think there's so many examples of that now. Are you, is this something you're thinking of doing or you are doing? Yeah, I am a writer. So I am thinking of doing that. Yeah. That is really cool. Hey, you should ping us later. We should talk. I want to, I want to see what you're writing. I'm happy to make that connection. Thank Please. you. Um, folks, I want to thank you all for being a part of this. I want to give a huge thank you, of course, to Judith for moderating this, to the Maisel's Film Center for hosting, um, to Jen and Franco for being here. And Rifka was here, I think, for a little bit. Um, and um, of course, to all of our partners and all of our supporters who make this possible, please join us all week tomorrow. We have a full day of programs starting at 2 p.m. with short films. Um, our short films are amazing. Um, Jen and Franco, before we let you go, I know you can't tell us exactly how the film's being released, but. Um, of course, we'll be happy to share with the audience uh, after the festival any any updates, but is there anything more you can share for them to kind of follow through? Uh, well, we're on all our socials are at Curve Mag Movie. And if you visit our site, curvemagmovie.com, you will uh, be the first to know the big announcement that's coming really any day <laughs> about where you'll be able to see the film. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. For Thank you we all really so much. Thank you. Um, for now, the film, of course, is available all week. Tell your friends, and we look forward to seeing you at other events this week. Much more to come. Thank you, and have a good night. <laughs>